Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next video. This one is on conic sections. This one is actually on all of the conic sections. Up until this point, we have talked about conic sections mostly independently. Each conic section was given its own section in the book and we looked at each individual formula for each conic section. We started with circles. Circles had a general formula. In that general formula was H, were H and K and R, which referred to the center and the radius of the circle. So here is just one example circle with radius 2, negative 3. I'm sorry, with center 2, negative 3 and radius 11 over 2. It can be represented with this standard form circle equation. This is one of our conic sections. This is, uh, if you slice a cone perfectly horizontally, you end up with a circle. Now, this is a convenient standard form equation here, but it's not the only way to write this equation. If we were to go through the process of squaring both, uh, squaring everything there is to be squared, we would end up with a formula that looks different, but it really is the same formula. For instance, if you square x minus 2, you get this perfect square trinomial. Y plus 3 squared gives us this guy. 11 over 2 times 11 over 2 gives us 121 over 4. It's always nice to rewrite things without fractions. So in order to get rid of the 4 in the denominator on the right side, we can multiply both sides of this equation by 4. Multiply everything in here by 4. And then combine like terms. And we get this formula down here at the bottom in red. This equation is the exact same as this equation. It's just written differently. If we were to graph both of these formulas, we would end up with the exact same circle. A circle with center at 2, negative 3, and with radius 11 over 2. The next conic section we took a look at was the ellipse. The form was somewhat similar, except this... Uh, Ellipse formula was set up to equal 1 instead of r squared. It also had a and b in it. Uh, a and b coincided with major and minor axes. Here is an example ellipse whose center is at 2, negative 3. It has a major axis, 6 units long. Minor axis, 2 times root 2. Take my word for it, this is the formula for that ellipse. However, it can be rewritten in another way. Again, how do we get rid of the fractions? We don't like the fractions. If I were to multiply both sides by 18, that would do the trick. 18 divided by 9 is 2. It sort of cancels out. It gets simplified. If we take this 18 and distribute it to the other fraction, we get 18 over 2, which is 9. Voila! No fractions anymore. 18 times 1 on the right side just becomes 18. So we can go through a bunch of algebraic steps uh, just to rewrite this thing. This new formula isn't necessarily going to be any more useful or illuminating. There's definitely a lot more useful information in standard form. Like if I gave you that formula, you'd be able to tell me the center and you'd be able to figure out a sketch of that ellipse pretty quickly. If you were given this red formula at the bottom, which represents the same exact ellipse, none of that information is going to be quite as clear. It is useful to know, though, that you can rewrite formulas and that this ellipse formula looks a little similar to the written out circle formula up here. Bunch of x squared stuff. There's a y squared stuff. There's an x. There's a y. There's a number with nothing attached to it, and it's all set equal to zero. Same thing is happening with our ellipse formula. If we expand everything out, we have an x squared term, a y squared term, an x term, a y term, and a what's called a constant term, uh, a term with no variable associated with it. All right, so just in case you want to know the steps, you have to take care of the exponent first. If you were to multiply this out, x minus 2 squared is this perfect square trinomial. y plus 3 squared is this trinomial. Once you 
write that out, then you can go ahead and multiply everything by two and multiply everything by nine. Combine like terms, that's what you get. Same idea, the hyperbola. Hy this hyperbola has a center of two, negative three. The vertices are here. The foci were here. If you really wanted to graph this thing, give me a little sketch, you could. You would draw the nice little magical rectangle. It would really be fantastic. Here is the um, standard form formula for this particular one. Now, if we wanted to rewrite this, we could multiply everything by 20. Why 20? Because it's going to get rid of these fractions. 20 over 4 is 5. 20 over 5 is 4. Multiply the right side by 20, we get the 20. Again, take care of the exponents first, and then distribute your 5 and your 4, and you will eventually get a formula with an x squared term, a y squared term, an x, a y, and a constant. That takes us down to parabolas. Parabolas are always kind of the weird one. Parabolas had a P in the formula. The P had to do with uh, distance to a directrix or distance to a focus from a given point. Uh, the H and K concept was similar though. Here is a particular parabola with vertex 2, negative 3. This one, it appears that P, the P value is 2 because 2 times 4 is 8. Um, let's see what we get. To get rid of that 1 eighth, guess what we're going to multiply both sides by? We're going to multiply both sides by 8. 8 and the 1 eighth just cancel out, and we're left with y plus 3 squared. y plus 3 squared is this perfect squared trinomial right there. The left side becomes 8x minus 16. Nothing too crazy there. Combine like terms. This one is very similar, except there's no x squared. If it helps, it actually it will help rather to um, connect this formula with the others. If we think about this formula starting off with a zero x squared. So if we keep moving down, here are all the formulas that we just went over. We have the circle, the ellipse, the hyperbola, and the parabola. Sure enough, they all have the same pattern. They all have x squared stuff. They all have y squared stuff. They all have x stuff. They have y stuff. And they have a constant term at the very end there. I'm not going to draw rectangles and learn all this stuff. You get the idea. So there is a general equation for all conic sections. And it looks like this. We've got x squared stuff. We've got y squared stuff. We've got x stuff, y stuff, and we have constant terms. And these letters out in front, a, c, d, e, and f, those are called the coefficients of the equation. So despite the fact that we learned all of these formulas separately, it shouldn't, or I hope it doesn't come as too much of a shock that there is one formula that could describe all of these different conic sections. Uh, that's because that these conic sections all come from the same place. They come from slicing cones. Here is a little diagram of uh, the different ways that you can slice these cones to get different conic sections. We got them all in there, but what I'm going to show you is this little animation. Uh, and what's nice about this animation is that it shows how the different conic sections can morph into each other. So if we start with a circle, which is made by a horizontal slice through a cone, if we turn the horizontal, or more tilt, if we tilt the horizontal slice, we can get an ellipse. For the record, that is spelled wrong. And maybe this is done in another language or something. If we keep tilting, 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 we eventually get a parabola. If we keep tilting, 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 we can morph into a hyperbola. And round and round we go. We're eventually going to get back to an ellipse and back to a circle. And we can demonstrate this with some graphing hardware, software from the World Wide Web here. What we have here is a uh, program that allows us to put in a formula 
but then put in these uh, different sliders that can change the value of each of our coefficients. So we're set up for A, C, D, E, and F. What I have in here are the coefficients necessary for the circle equation that we uh, started with at the very top. Here it is, the circle is made by a 4, a 4, a negative 16, a 24, and a negative 69. And if we go to the um, grapher, we have those coefficients right here. 4, 4, negative 16, 24, 69. We could change these to uh, and watch it morph into another conic section. So if we move A down less and less, we have morphed into an ellipse. At, one, at some magical point, this ellipse is going to get longer and longer and longer until it kind of explodes. The end kind of blows out and we get a parabola. If we keep going, the parabola morphs into a hyperbola and we can keep morphing, keep morphing. Let's do that a little faster. That's fun, isn't it? Real pow! And then we get a hyperbola and we could keep morphing this thing. Let's get that right at negative one. We could keep morphing this thing by taking our other slider for C and now we have a vertical hyperbola that is starting to morph back into a regular parabola and then into an ellipse and we can get it back into a circle by making A equal to C. Let's see that in reverse. And then we go back there. Ah, oh, that is fun. So there are a couple things to look for in this general equation to determine what sort of comet conic you're dealing with. It turns out that circles will always have A and C equal to each other. 4 and 4 gives you a circle. For ellipses, hyperbolas, and parabolas, they're different. Let's actually go down to the parabolas because it's pretty easy to see what determines a parabola. One of these coefficients has to be 0. You're either going to have a 0x squared, which is going to give you either a U-shaped or an N-shaped parabola. Or, actually I just lied, 0x squared is going to leave you with a Y squared. The Y squared is going to give you either a left-right, uh, a right-facing parabola or a left-facing parabola. Well, those are great diagrams right there. If the 0 was in front of the Y squared and you had some number over here, that would give you a up and down parabola, something like that. 2x squared plus 0y squared. As long as one of those is equal to 0, you are going to have a parabola. So how about the ellipse and hyperbola? For an ellipse, A and C are going to both be positive or both be negative. Here we have a positive, here we have a positive. That is an ellipse. If they're both negative, it would still be an ellipse. Hyperbola, we have one positive, one negative. That gives me a hyperbola. It's A and C that determine what sort of conic you're dealing with. Again, in summary, if A is equal to C, that is a circle. If A or C is equal to zero, you have a parabola. If A and C are different, um, then you either have an ellipse or a hyperbola. And let's see here, same sign for A and C. You have an ellipse. If the signs are different, then you have a hyperbola. Ooh, I spelled ellipse wrong too. What's going on? If the signs for A and C are different, you have a hyperbola. Let's take a look at this real quick. So back to the graph, A and C are the same. We have a circle. A and C are both positive, we have an ellipse. C is positive, but A is negative, we have a hyperbola. We could make this negative also. We go back to having an ellipse. There is an ellipse. And if C is negative and A is positive, we get a hyperbola. The D, the E, and the F will change the look of stuff, but it won't change its essence. Those are all hyperbolas. Different hyperbola, 
different hyperbola. That's all.